Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. <gasps> Fuck off. Oh my god, I can't believe this. Who would have thought I'd be back here again, eh? Surprise, surprise! <laughs> Yous can't get enough of me, can ya? Yous have missed me, innsha. Come on now, don't tell polkies. <laughs> I think I've done that. <laughs> But here we go. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to my library. If you're new here, hello, my name is Chinsia, and if you're not new here and you're one of my lovely regulars, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing splendidly. So today is the final of the three-part video series on Demeter, Persephone, and Hades. Uh, that's the anglicised version of saying his name. I believe it's more pronounced Hades uh, or Hades, uh, but we're going to say Hades because I don't want to sound that pretentious. I already sound it already, but I don't want to sound that pretentious. So as you already know, Hades is one of the most prominent figures in Greek mythology, particularly in contemporary society, as a figure in media and, you know, popularity. However, when it comes to actually digging up his past, there's very little out there. His prominence in the ancient world isn't as mm, exemplary as, say, Demeter and Persephone themselves. So it's interesting that Hades has become the more prominent figure in contemporary society. As we know already, Hades is the ruler of the underworld, responsible for maintaining order and ruling over the dead. And in this video essay, we will explore the little amount of history and mythology that surrounds Hades that we know of. But before I get into today's video, I need to thank today's sponsor, which is Squarespace again. Thank you, Squarespace, for sponsoring today's video. I have built all my main business websites over the past few years with Squarespace because I love how intuitive and easy it makes website design and layout. I don't know anything about coding because I just don't. Anyway, I don't know where I was going with that, but that's why it's made using other website platforms incredibly frustrating because when something goes wrong, you don't know how to fix it. However, with Squarespace, I can just simply drag and drop my content where I want it and also my design layout. And if you're a creator who wants to expand your revenue stream, then Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy for you to monetize your content and expertise in a way that fits your brand. Squarespace has a member area that lets you sell courses or classes to your followers. And Squarespace also has an inbuilt email campaign campaign option where you can collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers all from your website. And the inbuilt analytics feature gives you insight into who's visiting your website, traffic sources, the time they spend on your site, most read content, audience geography and so much more. So if you want to expand your revenue stream or just, you know, create a blog for your, you know, creative pleasure, then go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to finally launch your website, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So thank you so much Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. And now let's get into Hades. So what we know about Hades. According to Greek mythology, Hades was the firstborn son of the Titans, Cronus and Rhea, who were also brother and sister, because yes, that's basically the norm. Just, just accept that everyone's related in some form, usually when it comes to the Greek gods. So Hades had three older sisters who were Hestia, Demeter and Hera. Yes, Hades and Demeter were brother and sister, which made Hades taking his niece. It was just so weird when Hades took Persephone, it's just bizarre. Also Hera. And then he had the younger brother, Poseidon, and then obviously Zeus, who was a final one. However, before Zeus was born, Hades and all of his siblings were swallowed whole by their father as soon as they were born. Then according to Hesios Theogony, uh, Zeus was born, but then Rhea, scared that Zeus would be swallowed again by Cronus, gave Cronus like a little rock to swallow instead of the baby. She raised Zeus up to be very quickly, and then Zeus forced their father to disgorge all of his siblings. And then we went under the Titanomachy, which saw the Titans locked away in a pit in Tartarus. Uh, and then after that, the three brothers, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, drew lots to decide who would rule over the heavens, the sea, and the underworld. Now, technically, Hades actually drew the short straw and then became the leader of the underworld. And he was pretty damn unhappy with that, uh, but eventually he accepted his role as the ruler of the dead. It's quite boring down there. 
Now, considering how influential and popular the figure of Hades is throughout Western media in particular, Hades is actually pretty elusive in the ancient Greek world and contemporary academia. There aren't any philologists or mythologists who've written a single volume of research on Hades. And in one instance, Hades appears in archaic Greek literature, and he speaks for only 10 lines. In Walter Burkett's Greek Religion of 1985, he includes Hades only within chapters of the occults and worshippers of the dead. And Carl Karenyi and Walter Otto confine their discussion to Hades to their association with Hermes and Persephone, who are more prominent figures in Greek mythology. Hades never receives his own discussion, and this is likely because the ancient Greek storytellers often only referred to Hades than actually include him physically within the story that much. A few epithets for Hades uh, include the implacable Hades, the unyielding Hades, the dreaded Hades, and the uh, Hades of the underworld. Quite on the nose. Plato observed that people preferred calling Hades Pluton, which meant the giver of wealth, over the dreaded name of Hades or Hades? Hades? Uh, I'm going to say Hades um, because <laughs> Hades makes me laugh. Hence, we find that in ordinary life and in the mysteries, the name Pluton is actually more generally established amongst the ancient Greeks, whilst the poets actually preferred the ancient name Hades um, or a form of Pluteus. And this makes the discussion of the etymology of Hades a little bit uncertain. Now I'm going to pop these words and breakdowns on the screen because I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing them correctly and likelihood is I'm not. So the etymology of Hades is pretty uncertain. Uh, some derive it from the Aedean, uh, which is the word signifying the god that makes things invisible, and others take the name Hades from Hado or Chado, uh, so that Hades would mean uh, the all-embracer or the all-receiver. The Roman poets use the name Dis, Orcus, and Tartarus as synonymous with Pluton for the god of the lower world. Additionally, some scholars researching the etymology of the name argue that it descends from the Proto-Indo-European word weird or wade, meaning to see, again implying the name associated with the inverse, not being seen, and thus invisible. Now, this makes sense, considering Hades' most famous attribute in mythology is his cap or helmet or hat of invisibility. Again, it varies, basically saying you wear on your head. What word people use varies on the translator employing it. I'm going to say the cap of invisibility, though, to make it more generic. Uh, and this is actually referenced in Homer's Iliad. Uh, quote, This man, murderous Ares, was stripping, but Athena put on the cap of Hades so that massive Ares would not see her. What's interesting to note here is that Hades' cap of invisibility is only ever used by others, not Hades, implying that Hades doesn't require his power. He's already hidden in the background of someone else's story, and no one really takes heed of Hades or notices when he's there, which probably made abducting women much easier for him. Now, compared to the other gods of Olympus, Hades doesn't have an active role assigned to his duty. Yes, he's the ruler of the underworld, but unlike the figures such as the Grim Reaper, uh, he doesn't actually partake in the process of death. He's merely just a passive but protective figurehead of the dead. So if Hades doesn't actually have an active role in the world of the underworld, what's the point in having a deity of death at all? Well, the answer may lie in the Sumerian mythology. One of the most significant deities in the Sumerian pantheon was Enlil, the father of gods, who separated heaven from earth. All the gods wanted his approval, uh, but he loses favour with the gods when one day he rapes and impregnates the goddess Ninlil with the moon god Sin. Disgusted by his actions, which is very rare, considering we have the Greeks always, you know, gods uh, sexually assaulting and raping women, uh, the Sumerian gods were like, uh-uh, that's not okay. So disgusted by his actions, the gods actually banish Enlil to the netherworld, where he becomes the Sumerian Hades figure. Now, despite what he had done to her, pregnant Ninlil follows Enlil to the netherworld, uh, which sentenced his son in her stomach, Sin, to also live in the netherworld with netherworld. Netherworld. To also live in the nether, well, nether, nether world for all eternity with Enlil, and this would prevent Sin from becoming the ruler of the moon. 
You see, according to the Sumerian myth, and something which we see in later Greek mythology, is that those who entered the underworld could never actually leave the underworld. Thus, Enlil devises a plan to save his son, Sin. On his way to the netherworld, he meets three minor deities, the gatekeeper in charge of Nippur gates, the man of the netherworld river, and the ferryman of the netherworld river, which yes, we have also a ferryman in the underworld in Greek mythology. Now, Enlil takes the form of each of these three deities and in their form impregnates Ninlil with three netherworld deity babies, which ultimately substitutes the oldest baby in the womb, Sin, and then allows him to become free and ascend to heaven. I know, it's bonkers. Um, However, the Greeks kind of ran with this concept of the netherworld. Um, You see, we see in later mythology, particularly in the epics, that those who entered the underworld were not supposed to be able to leave, which is why only the greatest heroes, or the one heroine, Psyche, end up venturing down into the underworld and escaping to tell the tale. The hero's journey to the underworld, the Catabasis, is a crucial moment in the hero's quest, or monomyth, a moment of rebirth and baptism for the hero. The most detailed Greek presentation of the underworld features in Book 11 of the Odyssey, and its depiction is very different from that of the infernal regions of Virgil's depiction later. Homer's depiction of the entrance of the underworld is rather... basic. You see, Odysseus sails to a distant west, out of sea, and across the mighty ocean stream to its farther shore. He beaches his black-hulled ship on a lone waste beach, where stands the barren groves of Persephone, walks inland to a great white rock at the confluence of the Styx, Piriphlegeton and Acheron, and there he enters the land of the many-peopled house of dark-browed Hades. Note that the Odyssean realm of the dead is reached neither by descending into a cave nor by passage underneath an overhanging ledge. It's on the same level as the rest of humanity. He doesn't descend into anything. He kind of actually just strolls into the house of Hades, which is starkly different from later depictions of the underworld and then subsequently hell. The Hellenic people believed in an afterworld, where the souls of mortals departed at death and where they had a continued existence. But they entertained not merely the two conflicting beliefs, in fact they held at least four quite different beliefs regarding the destination and the abode of the souls of the dead. According to one of these beliefs, the soul of dead men ascended to Olympus, as did that of Heracles. According to another belief, they descended into the underworld, and in the 11th book of Odyssey, Homer places them on a continental region beyond the western verge of the ocean stream. According to another, they descended into an underworld. But then there's another belief that we see in the 11th book of the Odyssey, where Homer places them in a continental region beyond the western verge of the ocean stream. And then the fourth one, which is also emphasised by Pindar, You see, Pindar places the souls of the great heroes on islands of the blessed in the far western ocean. Pindar places the souls of sinful mortals in the underworld, subject to sentences reluctantly opposed upon them. And then Hesiod claimed that the men of the golden, silver and bronze ages were hidden away in the earth because of the different types of life imputed to them, and thus they had different conditions for their death. But the souls of his age of heroes, Hesiod argued, were given a life and an abode apart from men and established at the ends of the earth in islands on the blessed by deep eddying ocean. Okay, so Hesiod actually doesn't give us a direction to where these wondrous islands are, uh, but they're very much likely in the same direction as the Pandaric Islands of the Blessed and that in the Odyssean realm. And it was probably that it wasn't mentioned by Hesiod because it was so fixed in tradition of his day that no one needed to indicate where they were. Like, people knew where these islands were, apparently. So Hesiod dedicates over a hundred lines detailing the underworld, and he explains that Zeus subjugates the unfaithful gods to the underworld itself. Hesiod includes a crucial detail of our understanding of Hades, saying, quote, Hades was trembling, lord of the dead below, and so were the titans down in Tartarus, with Kronos in the midst, and the incessant clamour of the fearful fighting. Now, it sounds like it's quite basic, but this is actually pretty significant. I mean, for one, it indicates that Hades doesn't seem to participate in the war of the gods and titans, although some critics assume that he does, even though he's not actually detailed as doing so. Also, Hesiod groups Hades' fear 
of Zeus's power as a reaction similar to that of the Titans. Additionally, we also see from Hesiod and other Greek writers that Hades is somewhat equally blissfully ignorant. You see, he never actually hears anything from the land above him, aside from oaths and curses, and he doesn't partake in the Trojan War, nor does he partake in the war against the Titans. He kind of just sits down there in his little palace. Not only does Hesiod detail Hades as a frightened god, but so does Homer. In the Iliad, he writes, Hades below, lord of the dead beneath the earth, in terror leapt wailing from his throne in fear that Poseidon, shaker of the earth, would split the earth above him and reveal his house to mortal men and the immortal godsin of all its mouldering horror, which even the gods abhor. So as you can probably see from the lack of detailing of Hades anywhere in like literature, um, and also the fact that there's not much archeological evidence, Hades was not actually a popular god amongst the ancient Greeks. He was most frequently described as fierce and inexorable. We can only gather from mentions of him in the Georgics, Iliad and Odyssey, that when Hades was worshiped, people struck their hands on the earth and were most likely sacrificing black, male or white sheep. But also another interesting detail was that the person who offered the sacrifices had to turn their face away from the offering. Whilst scholars have extensively studied the ritualistic role that death and burial maintained from the time of the Minoans down to the ancient Greeks, Hades, or an archetype of Hades, does not explicitly appear in the Mycenaean or Minoan pantheon of gods. He is literally an invisible god. Yet despite all of that, Hades' legacy is still pretty prominent today in modern culture, with numerous references to him in literature, film, and television, and games. You know, I still stand by the notion that Hades would not have been a fraction as popular as he is today had it not been for the performance of James Wood as Hades in Disney's Hercules. I think that's what introduced me to loving Hades, and I think a lot of people follow suit. Though the used car salesman persona is exclusively uh, to James Wood's portrayal of him. Elsewhere, Hades is either an extreme lover or an incredibly demonic figure. See, one of the best selling points, best selling points of Hades is that he's believed by the vast majority of the population to be the best and most loyal god of all the Olympians in terms of a lover, uh, but that's not the case. Hades wasn't a loyal husband to Persephone that everyone assumes that he is. I mean, for starters, okay, the Furies are actually just called his daughters in several occasions, but who, you know, the relationship between that is very unknown, but his fu the Furies are known as his children. And he also had two other lovers that we know of aside from Persephone. We have the nymph Mintho, uh, who he loved very much, but uh, she was actually metamorphosed by Persephone into the plant Mint after she found them canoodling one another. And then we have the nymph Laoki, whom he actually again loved very much as demonstrated by uh, his kidnapping of her and bringing her to the underworld after he'd done the exact same thing to Persephone a while before. However, unlike Persephone, she wasn't immortal. So when Laoki died, Hades actually transformed her into a white poplar and transferred her into Elysium to honor her memory. Needless to say, Hades' role as the ruler of the underworld has influenced many depictions of the afterlife, including the concept of hell, but we have to do a whole history on the symbol of hell, uh, so that will be covered in another video. Hades also appears in various video games, which is my favorite medium, including God of War series, and obviously Hades. And there's also Hades Town Musical, Additionally, Hades' influence actually extends to modern science. We can't forget the little dwarf planet Pluto. Or rather, it, it, I mean, I remember the day when we had to learn Pluto as a planet and then we were told it's no longer one of our planets in the solar system. So that little tiny dwarf dot Pluto. Um, it was discovered in 1930 and was actually named after Hades, Pluto, Lord of the Underworld. And the name is fitting because the planet is located on the far reaches of our solar system, far from the warmth and light of the sun. Isn't that poetic? I think that's really quite cute. So yes, unfortunately, there's not much about Hades out there. There's little, I scraped and scraped, but Hades is an invisible god. He's very hard to track down, which is probably why people find it so enjoyable to play with his character and make him whatever they, you know, fancy, really. 
So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm sorry I've been gone for quite a wee while. I have not been well. Um, so I can only apologise, but hopefully I'm getting back into the swing of things. Uh, I'd like to thank again, obviously Squarespace for sponsoring today's video, but also I'd like to thank my top tier patrons, which were Jeffrey Staben, or Starben, I, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, if I mispronounced your surname, Arts Capitalist, thank you so much. You were so incredibly generous. Robbie Groves, um, Nicholas Reed, and Andrea Brazil, uh, or Andre Brazil. I'm going to say, uh, uh, please, please correct me if I mispronounce your names. I am so sorry, but thank you so much for your incredibly generous support of my channel and making it possible, making me do this for a living, even when I'm exceptionally poorly. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all of my Patreons in general. And I will see you soon for another video. Remember, there is a link down below for a video uh, recommendation form. So if there's something you want me to cover, please use the form. I've collected everyone that have submitted it into a little spreadsheet and you can remain anonymous or I can dedicate the video to you. It is up to your your, your request. So thank you to everyone who's used that form already. I really appreciate the video ideas and I will see you soon for another video. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.